Hi everybody, and welcome to the Digital VLSI Design course at bar Ilan University. I'm Dr. Adam Tiemann, and today we will be going on to Lecture 5, Timing Analysis. Okay, so Lecture 5 is the last part of our lecture discussing synthesis. During the synthesis flow, we briefly went over the fact that we have something called design constraints, where we constrain our design for a uh, op timing optimization goal. Now we'll go deeper into that, also discuss timing reports, and finally go into multi-mode, multi-corner design, which will kind of help us go from the synthesis optimization world into the real world, um, where we actually will go into physical implementation and continue with lecture six uh, in, that, in that field. But as a start, we'll remember what sequential clocking is. So synchronous design. Um, almost every single digital design that you'll run into is synchronous. Um, which means it's constructed with sequential elements. As we see here, we have the combinational logic that is all kinds of AND gates and OR gates and so forth, and it's just a function of the current inputs, a function uh, that Y is a function of uh, A, B, C, D, etc. Um, but what we want to do is we want to put in some registers, some sequential elements here, and they actually cover the current state of the design. So uh, when we drive the current state back into the input, it actually becomes a function of the present state of the design as well. And that allows us to do two important things. First of all, it eliminates races. And second of all, it enables us to do pipelining to increase throughput. Um, I'm not going to go deeply into the reasoning behind this. It's one of the basic uh, um, basic ideas that we have in digital systems. So um, just for this course, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that all our sequentials, all our registers are D flip-flops that are edge triggered. Um, in this case, they're going to also be positive edge triggered. We're going to mark that by having a little um, triangle on our on our flip-flops. Here the input is called D, the output is called Q, and that will kind of be what we'll be using uh, throughout the course. Okay, there are three critical prime, uh, timing parameters when we discuss um, D flip-flops. The first one is the propagation delay of the flip-flop, and it's it would look like we would be going from the D to the Q uh, output, but it's not the fact because the data arrives at the input here and waits for a while until the edge of the clock. So once the clock edges, then the data propagates to the output. So it's from the C, the clock pin, to the Q pin. Uh, so from C to Q, and that's called TCQ, and that's our basic propagation delay of our flip-flop. Um, the second timing parameter is what we call setup time. Setup time is the time that the data has to arrive here at the point at the entrance to the flip-flop here before the clock actually rises um, to ensure that it's actually captured in a correct fashion. And the fourth parameter is called T hold. Uh, the third parameter, excuse me, is called T hold, which is the amount of time that we have to keep our data stable here at the input to the uh, flip flop before we have a timing, e the next timing edge. Um, I'll discuss that in more detail in the following slides. So let's start with TCQ, which, as I said, is the type of propagation delay. It's the equivalent of TPD in a um, in a standard com uh, combinatorial um, gate. Um, so TCQ is the, the TCQ is the time from the clock edge until we get to the output. So it's from clock to Q. There is no path from D to Q because um, this is always going to be opaque. It's only at a singular point when we have this rising edge on the clock does the data transfer from D to Q. So the delay is triggered by the, um, the, the rising edge at Q and it's, sample, uh, and it's sampled either by a rising or falling edge on the Q output. So it's T, C to Q. Okay, we can see it here in the waveforms below. So we have some input signal D that we are going to be changing at different points of time. And here we have our clock edge that's periodically going to be rising. We mark with a little arrow the relevant edge. And since we're using positive edge triggered uh, timing, our flip-flops are positive edge triggered, we only care about the rising edge of the clock and only it has a little uh, arrow on it. So what we do is we take the time uh, uh, that the clock rises. We look at the 50% or whatever our lib is defined for, but we usually look at 50% uh, change in the rising edge of the clock, and we look for when the output ri uh, changes to 50%. Um, here, the output is rising 
uh, it's going from a low state to a high state. So we call this TCQ low to high. Um, if we look further along, then we see that in this case, our, uh, our data went and fell from one to zero. And so when we do this sampling and the clock again passes 50%, what we see is a falling edge on the output. So this is a high to low transition or TCQHL, and uh, we have another TCQLH over here. So TCQLH and TCQHL are different. Um, they have to be characterized differently, measured differently, and they are both covered in our lib files that we already looked at before. Uh, throughout much of the course, we will only um, say TCQ, not uh, differentiating between LH and HL just for simplicity, but of course you always have to look at both of them at the, the, the difference between them. Our next timing parameter is the setup time. So T setup or setup time, sometimes it's called TSU, is another type of thing that it will often appear as, is the time the data has to arrive before the clock to ensure correct sampling. So we um, can look at different circuit designs of flip-flops and understand why there is this constraint. But in general, we have some sort of a window that is around our uh, clock edge. So if this is a rising clock edge, we call the time before the, um, the clock edge that our data has to be stable as T setup, and the time that it has to be stable after the rising clock edge is T hold. So now we're talking about T setup, and it's defined in a positive manner in the, the, the left uh, looking direction. So the amount of time before the clock edge that the data has to be stable is the T setup. Um, what that means is that if our data arrived later than that, somewhere within this window here, then um, it will, we cannot ensure that the output will be correct. So let's look at our um, little diagram here, and our clock again periodically uh, changes with our little arrow on the rising clock edge. And here we have our input that, that changed at the entrance of the clock because of different data paths. So in this case, D uh, changed from 0 to 1 during this clock period. This is the last transition before the clock edge. And what we do is we look at the clock edge over here. Uh, um, we focus on this. We look setup time before the clock edge. That comes to this point. And we see that the last change of D was more than setup time before the clock edge. And that means everything is good. Again, we can go in here we have, and that's uh, actually the setup time for a rising change in D. Here, D falls, and we have a uh, falling change in D. And again, in the lib files, these are differentiated between setup time for a rising edge and setup time for a falling edge, though we will usually just discuss them as one for simplicity. So we have to, again, focus around our clock edge, look at how long the setup time is, and as long as the last change was uh, at least set up time before the clock edge, everything is good, and we copy this change out to the output in a manner of TCQ amount of time. This is TCQ, that's the propagation delay. The setup time is just a constraint that ensures correct functionality. Of course, our third little example will show that we have a, uh, a, setup, uh, a setup time violation. So here we have a, a change, a short time before the rising clock edge. If we focus on um, this area, we put our setup time over here, we see that the clock changed um, too late in the clock cycle, too, uh, too short a time before our clock edge, and that means we have some sort of violation. We cannot ensure that our data passed correctly, and that is considered a timing violation, which we're not allowed to ever do. In a similar fashion, we have T hold, and uh, remember, as we said before, we have our rising clock edge over here, and there's some sort of window around that edge that uh, the time before the clock edge that has to be stable is T setup, and the time after the, the, the data has to be stable is T hold. So T hold is defined in the right pointing direction. That means that we're, when we discuss a positive T hold, it's the amount of time after the clock edge that the data cannot change. Okay, so again, we um, take our clock here, and it's the same type of a clock, and we have some sort of changes in D. And we look here and we see that D rose over here. It has to be at least set up time before our clock edge, and it has to be stable for at least hold time after our clock edge. So we focus on the area following our clock edge, and we put in our T hold constraint, and we see that the change 
was after t hold so um, it was stable for at least this amount of time and therefore our tcq will work correctly again this is tcq the propagation from the clock edge to the q output but since the data changed at least t hold after that then everything is fine um, if we look at the next clock cycle again we look around the clock cycle and we see that the next change is much farther away uh, than we expect than than needed and so we probably had a good transition it was longer than t hold and we can see that this is the second tcq and it was for a falling edge on the output okay the the third case of course will be disrupted and here we have our clock edge and soon after we have our um, change in our data and it this was before the t hold constraint passed and therefore we get some sort of an error on our output um, Okay, so those are the three parameters that are interesting, and they provide us with our two main timing constraints that uh, can arise in synchronous logic, and that will now go with us until the end of this lecture, and actually until the end of the course. So the first one is called max delay. Um, the data doesn't have enough time to pass from one register, register to the next before the next clock edge, okay? Then again, we have min delay, which means that the data path is so short that it passes through several registers during the same clock cycle. In other words, there was kind of a race and the data just flew through two registers instead of going through one and stopping at the next one. Max delay violation are a result of slow data paths. So what happened was the data, again, didn't have enough time to pass from one register to the other. That's because the data path was very long. It was a very slow path. Okay, um, remember that the data has to ar arrive at the clock bef at least T setup time before uh, the, the sampling. So we often call this max delay path a setup path because we use T setup or we are not able to make it to the next register at least T setup time before the next clock cycle. On the other hand, min delays happen when the data is so, so fast, it's so, such a short data path that um, we can have a change at the next uh, at the next register before t hold is passed after the clock cycle and since t hold is relevant we call these hold paths so um, max delay and setup path and min delay and hold paths are synonymous and remember that max delay are slow and that also means that when we discuss timing corners we will bring ourselves to the worst case we'll figure that our data has to be as slow as possible to find out any uh, possible max delay di violations and on the other hand uh, min delays are mean our data is too fast so what we'll usually do is we will go and look at the fastest possible um, path that can happen the fastest possible operating conditions to find our max delay violation our min delay violations so now let's look deeper at this max constraint again this little turtle over here this slow guy let's see what makes up our clock cycle and again here we have the um, clock signal which we'll see in a second we have this data that we change once at the beginning of the uh, of the path from zero to one and we have two points along our timing path a and b b is of course at the uh, entrance to the second register and a is our q is the net right at our q point and there's some sort of logic between which has some sort of a t logic delay in between the uh, input and output and that's completely combinatorial or combinational okay so what happens is is that our clock rises over here and the rising clock causes this um, TCQ uh, delay so we see it over here a changes from 0 to 1 TCQ after the clock rises then there is this T logic path that goes by and B changes over here um, T logic after um, after our rise at a okay what we need to make sure of is that this change which is going to be our last change in this example happens at least T setup before the next clock edge when does the next clock edge happen according to the period of our clock so the period of the clock happens over here this is the next rising edge and we just have to make sure that that happens at least T setup after this last change and then everything is okay what we get here is a type of a race. So we call this green path over here from the clock, through the queue, through the logic, and to the D point of the register as the launching clock edge. We will also call this often the arrival time. 
okay, or the data arrival time at the next register, okay. On the other hand, we have the capture clock, okay. This is the path that captures the data at this register. This is called the capture path, okay. Um, and that happens one period later. So this, this is one period, okay, a big T. It happens one period after the launching path. And we have to make sure that the capture path um, happens uh, once the data has already arrived. So we need to make sure that the capture path is larger than the data path. Okay, so we need T capture to be larger than T um, logic. But it's not only that, it's actually a T plus the T capture because it happens one cycle later, or T launch, I should say, launch. Okay, so let's see that in a, in a sim more simplified graphic. So we have this type of a register to register path with some sort of combinational logic inside and the point where the clock reaches the first flip-flop to the point where the clock reaches the second flip-flop and we want our launch path to be shorter than our capture path. And how do we um, show that? We have T, the big, uh, uh, the big T is the clock period, it has to be larger than the TCQ Okay, that's TCQ plus the T logic, that's T logic. Okay, plus the setup time of this guy. You can also have the setup time of this guy being uh, uh, on a minus on this side of the equation. Um, that is the simplified version of our, of our uh, timing constraint, of our max constraint, but there are non-idealities. The clock will be non-ideal later on in the course, and so what we have to do is we have to define clock skew and some other guard bands. So let's start with our clock skew. Um, positive clock skew is defined as the time that the second clock, the, the, the clock to the capture register arrives after the, um, the clock arrives to the launch register. And so therefore it's in this direction. That's positive clock skew. In other words, if this clock happens after this clock, we get negative clock skew. So it's a minus of this direction, but that's just the definition. Okay, therefore, what we see is that clock skew, this green thing, is added to the capture path. Then again, we also would like to guard band for other things that we'll discuss a bit later on in the course, which are all kinds of margins that can go into the, 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 the data path to ensure that we are um, actually catching all of the cases. So this margin over here is part of the launch path. And therefore, when we add these two deltas, these two um, parts, we have the T plus this delta skew over here. This would be delta skew, and this will be delta margin. So T plus delta skew is on the capture path, which has to be larger than TCQ plus T logic, plus the T setup that we discussed already, plus this delta margin that we have added here. And we will discuss later on where delta margin comes from and where delta skew come from. So that's our max constraint, our min constraint. So min constraints are always tough to understand at this point because we do have an ideal clock and often registers have even a negative hold constraint, a negative T hold. But I will go over it anyway on, on the basic type of a, of a view and Later on, we will understand this or we will perceive it better. Um, it's just a definition, but we, we, we have to see why it happens once we add uh, non-idealities in the clock. So hold problems occur due to the logic changing before T hold is passed. So in this case, um, what we have here is this logic, which is really fast. So this is short, okay? And what, what happens is it has nothing to do with the cycle time. We have the same clock cycle the clock rises, it reaches both here and here. It may not reach at the same time, but not because it's two separate edges of the clock, but because there may be some skew along this path, okay? So um, you have to remember that hold time is relative to a single clock edge and not two subsequent clock edges. Okay, so let's see how that works. The clock rises at this point, and what we have is our same TCQ, that makes a change over here. And again here, because we are looking at the fastest possible time, we'll look at the quickest type of TCQ possible or TCQ under the quickest and fastest operating conditions. 
Then we go through our T logic, and our T logic, as you see here, is very short. Think of something like a shift register, which, are, which is connected um, with two flip flops together with no logic in between. That's going to be a real short T logic path. So, since the data had to stay stable for T hold after the clock for the second register, the change at B had to be at least T hold after the clock edge. So what we want to see here is that from this clock edge, at least T hold time passed before we had this change arrive at B. Okay, so that is, that is what happens and we'll see why um, this might not be. You see that there is no second clock edge here. This second clock edge is irrelevant. It's all relative to this clock edge. We want to see that this happens from here until the logic changes at the next register takes at least T hold amount of time. So let's look at that again, looking at the capture and the launch path. So the launch path in this case is again, this TCQ, this guy, plus this T logic, but it's going to be some sort of a minimum logic. It's also going to be some sort of a minimum TCQ. Okay. Um, on the other hand, our hold path, well, we don't have a big T because it's according to the same clock edge, but we do have a hold time constraint. Okay. So this is the capture path that's triggered on the same clock edge. And what we see is that we want this plus this, this is the launch path, T launch, in this case, to be bigger than T capture. That's our, um, that's our max delay, I uh, mean delay constraint, our hold constraint. Okay, so it comes out TCQ plus T logic has to be larger than the T hold of this register. Okay, that's pretty easy to meet because TCQ is always going to be um, larger than zero. You, or I can't say always, but in the most normal cases. And T logic is also going to be larger than zero. Um, T hold, as I said, can be zero or even negative for some flip flops. So this is almost given at a synthesis stage. And that's why during synthesis, we didn't discuss hold paths at all. And we didn't, we wouldn't check it at all. But once we add clock skew, and several other guard bands, because T hold is a very big problem, what happens is, again, this is the positive clock skew, and it's on the capture path, which is over here. So we have to add this delta skew over here to the capture path. Okay, and we'll also add our margin, but this time we want the margin to be um, not according to some sort of a definition because this margin is right now very abstract and we haven't said what it is. We just are saying that this margin is going to be worse for us. And since it's on the data path and we want the data path to be bigger than the capture path, we're going to add it in a negative uh, manner. So what we get to is that TCQ plus the T logic over here minus this margin, whatever this margin is, um, which we will define later on, and it, it's kind of fluid what the definition is, will be bigger than T hold plus this now delta skew that we added here. And if delta skew is really large, we may not meet um, this thing, or if delta margin is really large as well. Um, and that's why hold becomes very important. But the important thing to look at here is that there is no parameter such as our big T, which was an external parameter. So if in during setup, we could just lower our clock period and meet the setup uh, uh, timing, there is no such possibility in hold. So let's summarize that whole thing. For setup constraints, the data has to propagate fast enough to be captured by the next clock edge. Remember our data, we're looking at the slowest possible thing that our data could be. So T launch is really, really slow. It becomes very big. And we have to make sure that it's smaller than the, the, the clock cycle plus whatever the capture that, that is uh, affected by delta skew. Okay, this sets our maximum frequency. And if we have setup failures, failures, we can always slow down the clock. So again, t is this external um, variable, if we have some sort of failure here, we can just take t make it larger, which means to slow down the clock, make the frequency slower, and then um, we will meet the setup constraint. So we may not be able to sell our product at the speed that we wanted to or at the highest speed possible, but at least it will be functional. That is not the case for hold. In hold, we have um, the, the data path 
has a delay has to be long enough so it isn't accidentally captured by the same clock so we don't skip a register and ruin our whole state machine okay so this time we have this launch path has to be larger than the capture path and um, the problem is for t launches that are real fast in other words if t launch is really slow and we have some skew on our capture path then uh, we may not meet that constraint the problem is that it's independent of the clock period there is no big t in this um, equation and since there is no big t here we can't actually do anything after we have manufactured the chip to save that and in this case if we have a hold failure we have to throw that chip away so now that we remembered what sequential cl clocking is and defined the different types of um, parameters of a flip-flop and the two basic timing paths that we're going to check we can move over to some algorithms of static timing analysis or why and how to calculate slack um, this section is heavily based on rob rutenbars from logic to layout lecture 12 from 2013 if you want to see a better and more detailed explanation ex explanation do yourself a favor and go see the original one of the best courses and best teachers i've ever learned from so static timing analysis or we often call it just sta so static timing analysis checks the worst case propagation of all possible vectors for min and max delays the advantages of static timing analysis and this is actually very very cool um, it's much faster than timing driven gate level simulation but the biggest thing is it's exhaustive exhaustive means that every single constraint timing path is checked we may have millions of paths in our design and we check every single one of them to find the worst case to find any type of slack which we will discuss what that is soon um, that we have in our design and fix everything and we do not need to generate any vectors of functional vectors of how the design is actually operating to um, to do static time analysis the disadvantages is, is that we uh, we do not check proper circuit functionality that we need to have different types of functional verification to check and we also have to define timing requirements or our constraints that we'll discuss later um, and if we add all kinds of wrong timing requirements or exceptions we may block real timing violations garbage in brings garbage out so you have to be really careful and know what exactly you're defining and how it um, affects the design so some limitations of uh, static timing analysis that we better know about it's only useful for synchronous design so if we're using asynchronous design it doesn't um, necessarily at least know how to deal with this um, it doesn't know how to do things like cross uh, clock domain crossing um, it cannot analyze combinational feedback loops so if we have something like a flip-flop that's made out of basic gates it will uh, drive the static timing analyzer nuts or if we have some sort of ring oscillator any type of a combinational feedback loop feedback that doesn't go through a sequential element is uh, it won't work and you'll get warnings and errors from your synthesis tool or your timing checker okay another thing it does not check for glitching and glitching effects on asynchronous pins and uh, therefore we have to do different checks for this so um, to start this we have to define what a timing path is so a path is any type of a route that goes from a start point to an end point we can see down here a kind of a picture of how we divide our design we have our design that we're working on the scope or the current design we're working on is this it has a flip-flop and it has a comb combinatorial logic and another flip-flop and they get a clock that's input from a certain point and gets to all the flip-flops in the design but there are paths that come from inputs to the design and paths that go to output to the design. There may be some combinatorial logic in between this input to the flip-flop, but we don't know where it comes from. Everything over here and everything over here is outside of our scope. It may be outside the chip or outside of the, the block that we are working on. We don't know what is there, okay? As you see here, there is some sort of flip-flop or some element somewhere in the world that is clocked in some way because it is a synchronous design and it's somehow passing the data to us through some sort of a combinatorial loop we don't know anything about that and we have to model it in order to make it fit our max delay and min delay constraints that only know how to deal with this register to register synchronous type of a path same goes here we have this flip-flop here that's driving 
some sort of a, um, uh, a cloud here, a combinatorial cloud, and it reaches this output point, which we don't know anything that happens over here. And therefore, we have to make some sort of a model for this thing so we can deal with this just in the same way that we're dealing with our current design. Therefore, I'm going to now um, define that our start points are two types of things. First of all, it's the start point for a regular reg to reg path. And what we said is the thing that triggers the reg to reg path is this clock pin. So our start point is the clock pin of the flip-flops. Those are our regular start points in our design. Um, and then we have the uh, input ports to the design. These guys, they are also uh, start points for our design. Endpoints, well, uh, according to as this is a start point, we also have this primary output or uh, port of our design. That's an endpoint. But the standard endpoint endpoints are these D um, uh, D pins of the flip-flops. Um, I just want to mention that you can have all kinds of hard macros such as memories. They may have a clock pin, so it's also a uh, both a start point and uh, the as an endpoint uh, the data pins of such a uh, of a, such a clock um, hard macro are also are also endpoints. Note that there that this is a typical design or this is a small part of a typical design, but you have flip-flops that can be uh, their clock pins are all start points and you have flip-flops that their data pins are endpoints and this guy can talk to uh, all these guys right so there can be many endpoints for each start point um, there can also be many start points for each endpoint maybe this goes somewhere around like that so we have all this whole mix this mesh of everything that can go to everywhere and in fact sometimes or often we can have two uh, paths that go from the same start point to the same end point. So there are lots and lots and lots, millions of these combinations of paths depending on the number of flip-flops we have in our design and the amount of logic, but mainly the number of flip-flops. Um, another thing that there are feedback paths. Feedback, if it goes through a flip-flop, is fine. So it could be actually that this flip-flop goes through some logic and then comes back to the deep end. So even uh, the same flip-flop can be the start point and the end point of the same of a single path. So uh, a flip-flop can be both the start point and an end point in different paths or even in the same path. In static timing analysis, we usually categorize our design into four categories of timing paths. So we have our basic paths that we discussed before, and you can see a, a type of a, a, um, an illustration here that we'll use often in, 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 the, in future slides. But if we have everything in our design, we have the two flip-flops in our design, we know about the whole clock path in our design, we see the start point and the end point and everything in our design, that's called a reg to reg path, register to register. We can time this without any external timing models. That's our favorite and uh, usually our most common type of a path. But that's not the only type of path. As we mentioned before, we have these types of um, um, paths that go from a flip-flop in our design through some sort of a combinational cloud to a, one of these uh, output ports. And in this case, we don't know anything about what's going on over here outside our module or outside our chip. And therefore, this is a different type of a path. And we call this a reg to out path from a register to the output. And we have to deal with it separately. Similarly, we have primary inputs or ports uh, to our design that come and they reach our, um, our flip-flops and we don't know what's happening before them, what generated them and what the clock was before that and so forth. We'll have to model that. So those are also uh, sep treated separately and those are called in to reg paths as you can see here. And finally, we have paths that are asynchronous. They do not go through any flop. They would be in to out paths and they just have a combinational delay um, inside the chip. So those are four types of paths that we'll be differentiating between and usually we'll separate them in our different timing reports. So now let's go over the goals of our static timing analysis algorithm. And what we want to do is we want to verify these max delay and the min delay constraints. We want to verify it for all paths in the design and make sure they're all met. Okay, we're going to start with a gate level net list. We're going to have timing models. The timing models are provided for every gate in the library. Without having timing models, we can't run our static timing analysis. And what we have to do, our goal is to report if any path violates the max and min delay constraints. But is that enough? And the answer is no. We want to know every path that violates the timing constraints. And we would also like to know in the order of their violation, how bad they violate them. Um, not only that, we also want to know where the violations occur. 
it's pretty amazing that we can actually do all of this in a pretty simple algorithm that runs really quickly um, when you're discussing millions of paths. So we have to do some basic assumptions here for our algorithm. One is that our design is synchronous. As I said, the static time analysis algorithm do not uh, deal with asynchronous circuits. Okay, we will only show how to deal with combinational elements and max delay constraints, but you can easily adapt this to min delay constraints as well. Okay. Um, we will assume a pin-to-pin -pin delay model. In other words, each gate has a single constant delay from instant to output. We know that in the real world, that is not true. Gate delay is affected by many factors, gate type, loading, waveform shape, transition direction, particular pin random variation, many other things affect this. And as we saw, these are all defined inside .lib files in the Liberty um, uh, format. Uh, but to make this simple, we're just going to use this pin-to-pin -pin delay model, which shows for every pin to, every, to uh, an output, we have a certain delay that's kind of normalized into some sort of a unit. Okay, and finally, we will take what's known as a topological approach. So a topological approach doesn't look at all at the logic functionality. We don't care if a gate is an AND or a MUX or a NOR. We just care that it's some sort of a gate with some sort of a timing relation between the input and output. And we're going to look at that and, and be able to, to take it into a graph. If we had to look at a topological, at the top, topology uh, of, the, of the functionality of the graph, it makes it much more complex. And we'll have to discuss how this affects us later. So um, using those assumptions, we're going to de uh, develop this simple path representation. Let's say we have the following circuit. So we have two AND gates here, two inputs A and B. The output of this first AND gate is called C. Um, the input to this AND gate, the other input to the, this AND gate is called D. And the final output of the design is called E. We look into our standard cell library, and we see that an AND gate is defined that from both inputs uh, input one and input two we have a timing arc uh, with a delay of two to the output okay what we're going to do is we're going to build a graph we're going to build a graph made out of vertices and edges a directed acyclic graph okay for each input and each internal node we are going to uh, create a vertice a wire okay um, there's one per each gate output with CMOS logic at least you're not allowed to drive uh, a, a certain output from two uh, gates so we're only going to have one of those nodes for each output um, and we're so we're going to have uh, one of these vertices for each start point each end point and each output of a gate so we have a b c d and e are all going to be vertices in our graph then we're going to have the edges and the edges are um, any of these arcs from input to output pin so we have from one from a to c one from b to c one from c to e and one from d to e as you can see here we're also going to write what the delay of each of those um, edges was. Finally, what we're going to do is a little trick here that's really cool. We're going to add a source and a sync node, a primary input and a primary output, so we can have all of our paths um, in, uh, looked at in one sweep. So what we do is we just add this source, and we know that the delay, the timing arc from the source to all of the primary inputs is just zero. And again, we put a, a, a sync um, that's connected to all the outputs, and the delay from the outputs to the sync is just zero, and that's going to help us deal with everything in one shot. Now, so what we're going to do is an algorithm called node-oriented timing analysis. Um, basically, you would think that what we would do is we'd enumerate every path. So we'd go look and write out every path, and we'd start to um, see what the delays are through it and check if it meets max delay and min delay. But very soon, we'd get this exponential explosion in the number of paths. We have millions of paths. It would take a long time to run such an algorithm. Instead, we'll use this node-oriented timing analysis that looks at um, the worst delay for each node along any path and there, thereby is able to find what the worst path is. For this we need to define two important values. One is arrival time at a node or at and this is the longest path from the source to the node. So we have the source, we have some sort of a node n and the at is the arrival time, the, the longest path uh, to get to node n. Okay. Then we have the required arrival time at node, or the required time, often called the RAT. So this is the latest time that the signal is allowed to leave the node and make it to the sync on time. And our slack is defined as the required time minus the arrival time. This, of course, is for a setup delay. So what our required time, what our capture time is, or the required time is similar to capture time, minus the uh, arrival time, which is how uh, long it took to get there, um, so the delay of the launch path. 
Um, I like to show slack um, uh, with a little type of a rope, and that's because I was in in uh, in boating in the navy, and in boating you have slack on a rope, which is how much more room actually you have until the rope is too tight. Once the rope is too tight and you have negative slack, that rope is going to rip. So we would never want to have negative slack, as Rod Brutenbar says. Negative slack is something you wouldn't want to wish on your worst enemy. So how do we compute ats and rats? Well, we do it like a lot of the different algorithms that we're going to be discussing in this course and that we've discussed so far. We do it recursively, okay? So the arrival time at a node is just the maximum of the arrival times at all the predecessor nodes plus the delay from that node. This is described here in a very simple um, equation here. So the arrival time at node n is zero for the source and for any other node, it's the arrival time at all, uh, uh, the arrival time at its worst pre well, it's the arrival time at the predecessor plus the delay from the predecessor to n, and we take the maximum of all of those. So let's look at this graphically. We have all of these nodes here. They are the predecessors to n. They are all the nodes that drive the fan in basically to n. So we look at each one of these. We already know recursively what its arrival time is and we see how much the arrival time plus the delay of the edges and we take the the longest one of that those that is the arrival time at node n similarly when we want to find the required time uh, the required arrival time it's just the minimum of all the required arrival times at the successor nodes minus the delay to that node so when we want to look at the rat at node n first of all as a stopping point uh, at our sink, it's t, big T, right? That's the, the um, final required arrival time. It has to make it there before our uh, clock period. Um, and then for each of the other nodes, we have a minimum between the required arrival time at all these guys minus the edge from one of these successors to uh, the node itself. So we take all of these guys, we look at what the rat was to one of them, which we've already calculated, um, uh, subtract the edge that we have here, and the smallest of all those is the required arrival time. Let's see how we can, uh, first of all, let's try to understand this graphically. So this is the clock cycle time, our t. Um, that's the time it should take from the launch path to get to the end, um, and this is the capture edge. So that's the first edge of the clock and the second edge of the clock, and there is a, a time period of t between them. And what we have here is the at is the longest logic delay after the launch of the clock. So the at is the longest delay it could take for a, uh, a, a, for a signal to arrive um, a, a, at a certain node. The rat is the latest, it's the longest it could be and still make, uh, make it on time. And that way we have the rat, it had to make it by this time. It actually made it by this time. So when we take the rat minus the at, we get the slack. And what we have in green here is what's known as positive slack. And positive slack is good. That's what we want. That means we met our timing goal. On the other hand, if we look at a, a worst case where we have this long arrival time that ran here way past the halfway point of the, the clock, and we have this long required time that also ran way pa past uh, uh, the clock, when we take the required time minus the arrival time, what do we get? we get negative slack. And negative slack, as I said, is not something you want to wish on your worst enemy. So that's a timing violation. We don't want any negative slack in our design. Remember though, on a setup path, which is what we're showing, we can always just make this clock period longer and then we would arrive at a positive slack situation. So let's see an example of this. We have this um, strange combinatorial type of a logic and uh, you can assume that over here are start points, different flip-flops, and over here are end points, different flip-flops that capture it. And we want to see what the worst path is through all of these guys. When um, we're given this t equals 12, that's, our, uh, that's the time we want to meet. And we have, again, the library models of all of these different timing arcs, all of these different gates. So we want to fill in a little table for each vertice that has the rat, at, and the slack of each of them, and we can quickly find out if we meet timing and figure out what the worst path is. And this is really nice. So let's see how it works. We take our uh, design, and what we have to do is we have to represent it as a directed acyclic graph. Again, what we're going to do is we're going to make a node for each one of these A, B, C, D, G, E, F, um, H, J, K, and N. Okay? 
and all of the co connections between them, for example, from A to D is going to be 1, as we see here. From D to G, we're going to have 3. From D to F, we're going to have 5. From, for example, F to K, well, there's F, there's K, it's going to be a delay of 3. So this is just a one-to-one -one representation of this according to the assumptions or the, the instructions that I discussed beforehand. Um, the other thing we had to do, we made one node that's called the source, and we connected it with a zero delay path to all of the primary inputs, and we have one node that's the sync, and we connected it with a zero delay path to all the primary outputs. Now what we're going to do is we're, connect, we're going to compute all the ats from the source to the sink. So we're going to make a little table here. And the first rubric of the table is going to be um, the at. So this guy's the at. Later on, this guy's going to be the rat. And finally, this guy will be the slack. So obviously, as our end uh, condition, the at at the source is 0. And if we look, there's only one, uh, one edge to each a, b, and c. So if we take the at plus um, uh, the at at the predecessors of a uh, plus the edge, it's also going to be 0. And again, it's going to be trivially 0 for b and c. Um, so let's look at d. And again, it's only a single input gate. And that's really easy because we just take the at of the predecessor, which is 0, plus the edge delay. That's a 1. And we arrive at an arrival time of 1. If we go at g and e, they too are also one input gates, they're just inverters. So we, for g, we take the at at d, we add 3, and we get an arrival time of 4. And here we take the at here, which is 0, add 2, and we'll get an at of 2. Um, f is where it starts to get interesting because now it's a 3 input type of a, a gate um, over here that brings us to this node f. So at node f, we have to go, first of all, over here to d. Look, and we have an arrival time of 1, plus this edge is 5. So we write here for a second 6. OK, then we look at this guy. We have 0 plus 4. We write 4 over here. We look at this guy, 0 plus 1. And that would be 1. So obviously, 6 is the worst case. And we have a total at of 6. Now we can look at h. h, again, has two inputs. So it would be 6 plus 4, that's 10, and 2 plus 3, that's 5, and our arrival time will be 10. Now we can go to j. j is 4 plus 2, that's 6, and 6 plus 1, that's 7, so our arrival time will be 7. k, we take um, 6 plus 3, that's 9, and we take uh, 10 plus 2, that's 12. And we'll get 12. Um, and here we have k, uh, sorry, uh, n is just um, 10 plus 5, so it's 15 over here, right? And now we look at the sink. Sink is just the worst case of all three of these. So it will be 15 plus 0, or 12 plus 0, or 7 plus 0. And obviously, the worst case arrival time then is 15. So we've filled in our, all of our ats for each of these nodes. Now we can go and look at the same thing to compute the rat. So we know that the end, uh, the end game is that we want to meet t equals 12. So our uh, final condition is that the sink, um, the required arrival time at the sink will be t, which is 12 in this case. So we fill in 12 here. And obviously, since all these edges are 0, we get 12 for all of our primary outputs. OK, now um, we start going along, and we look at node h. So node h has a, a fan out of 2. So we go, first of all, to k over here, which uh, the, the um, required arrival time at k is 12, minus 2. That comes out 10. And we have um, at n, it's 12 minus 5. That comes out 7. And 7 will be our worst case. OK, next we'll go over to g. g is simple. It just has one edge. So 12 minus 2, that will be 10. And f, f is more interesting. It has a fan out of 3. So 12 minus 1, that would be 11. 12 minus 3, that would be 9. And um, 7 minus 4, that'll be 3. So we're going to arrive at, an arri at a required arrival time of 3. Next we go to e. e, we take the 7 minus 3, we get a 4. OK, d, we have a fan out of 2. So we go 10 minus 3, that's 7. And 3 minus 5, uh-oh, minus 2. We have something very strange here. We arrived at a negative number, 
right? So we have minus 2 over there. And finally, we'll go over to a. a just is minus 2 minus 1, so it's going to be minus 3. And for um, b, we have 3 minus 4. Hmm, that's going to be minus 1, another negative number over here. And for c, we have a uh, fan out of 2, so it's 3 minus 1, which is 2. And 4 minus 2, which is 2, so the rat at uh, C is going to be 2. The worst case of all these, of course, is minus 3, so the source is going to get minus 3. Now, that was very interesting. We have these negative rats, and we want to see what that means. Well, it's pretty easy. Remember that we left our third rublic here to be for slack. And slack, in the case of setup, is just rat minus at. Rat minus at. Okay, so it's going to be really easy now to calculate the slack. For each of these, we're just going to go 12 minus 15, right? That's minus 3. Um, 12 minus 7, that's uh, 5. 12 minus 12, that's 0. 12 minus 15, that's minus 3. Uh, 7 minus 10, that's minus 3. 4 minus 2, that's 2. 3 minus 6, minus 3. 10 minus 4, that's 6. Minus 2 minus 1, that's minus 3. Minus 3 minus 0 minus 3, minus 1 minus 0 minus 1, 2 minus 0 is 2, and minus 3 minus 0 is minus 3. Okay, so um, we'll have that now filled in uh, nicer than my handwriting, and now, uh, we've calculated the slack. And the interesting that comes out here is if we look at this, we look at the worst case slack over here at the uh, output is minus 3. And if we look and find all the minus 3's in the design, we'll see that there's a minus 3 here, and 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 a minus 3 here. And lo and behold, there is a path that actually goes through all of these minus 3's. Um, let's see. And so what did we find? We found the worst case of the whole thing. That is the critical path of the design. Now we know that since it's the worst negative slack, that's the path that we have to go and work on and find out if we can reduce the slack and what actual node made our slack happen. Um, and uh, we have to reduce the slack, try to make it better, see where our timing problems are. If we can fix them, then what happens is we can uh, recalculate our, uh, our slack with an incremental, um, an incremental uh, operation on here and easily um, fix the next path and the next path and so on. Finally, um, by actually storing this in a heap, we can always remove the top of the heap, which is the worst uh, negative slack type of a uh, path, and run a heapify command, which runs in logarithmic time, and we can find uh, what the new worst case path is. So it's a pretty amazing algorithm that can solve uh, this problem of timing analysis very efficiently and uh, deal with millions of paths in a reasonable amount of time. There is one problem called a false path. So we saw how to find rat at and slack at every node, and this can be done very, very efficiently, and it can be adopted for min timing, sequential elements, latch based timing, etc. Even better, we can quickly report the order of the critical paths. However, this was done all topologically without looking at the logic. Why is this a problem? Well, we have this nice graph here that shows this uh, timing thing, and it's easy to see that A to D to D to F, F to G, and G to J, just by looking at it with our eyes and without running our whole algorithm, we can easily see that that's the worst case path. Okay, and that path took up 8 plus 2 plus 8 plus 2. Um, it took us uh, 20 uh, delays to get there. But if we would have looked at this top, um, function, functionally, we may have seen, for example, that this guy here was a mux. It was the output of a mux. And um, J over here was the output of another mux. And the mux was connected such that if we looked over here, this node C went through an inverter. And therefore, if we had a 0 over here, we would have a 1 over here. And in this case, we would be going through a path that went through the 0 here and through the 1 over here. And then again, if we had a 1 over here, and a zero over here, our path would be going this way. There is no such path that goes this way. So it is obviously not our worst case timing path, and our timing is much easier because this whole path would make 8 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2, and that's 13, not 20. Okay, so that means that what we have to do is define a false path and say, listen, this guy here is a false path, and this guy here is a false path. Take them out of our timing graph and don't look at them. But it's much harder to do that. The algorithms are much uh, uh, much longer running, and usually it's done by um, constraining this manually, which we'll discuss later on in this lecture. 
So we've gotten to the point of our lecture where we will show our Chip Hall of Fame, and we're discussing timing in this um, in this lecture. So I wanted to speak about a timer. It's the Signetics NE555 timer, a very well-known chip. Here's the schematic of it over here. It's really simple, um, and here's a picture of this uh, very very famous chip um, in this uh, dual uh, input pin um, type of a uh, of a package, a little bug. Um, in Hebrew, we call it a juke because of, it looks like a, a little beetle or something like that. And um, this was a simple timing chip that is still popular today, amazingly. It was released all the way back in 1971. Then it was on BJT. Now I think it's made uh, uh, with uh, CMOS. But it's still used today in breadboard type of systems. Um, it had 23 transistors, 16 resistors, and two diodes. That's the whole type of a chip and it can function as a timer, a pulse generator, or an oscillator depending on how you hook up the PIDs according to the data sheets. It was designed by Hans Kamerzind who also introduced the phase lock loop, the PLL, um, to integrated circuits um, in a paper, in a groundbreaking paper in ISSCC in 1969. So he's a pretty important guy in, in the whole field. Um, One billion units of these were manufactured per year in 2003. I didn't find the number for today, but that's pretty amazing that um, three decades after this chip was introduced, they were still selling a billion units per year. So that's uh, that, that's the uh, Signetics NE555 timer, and that's our Chip Hall of Fame uh, uh, inductee in 2017 for that, that I wanted to show you today. So now that we've finished discussing some of the algorithms behind static timing analysis, we want to go back to our design constraints that we had to define after elaboration of a, during the synthesis flow and see how we actually set the uh, t equals 12 from before, the false path that we discussed before, and so on. So timing constraints. Here's a stupid question. How does the STA tool know what the required clock period is? We've been discussing all the time that we have this nice waveform of a clock, and this is our T or our clock period. How do we know what the clock period is? And the obvious answer is that we have to tell it. We have to define constraints for the design. We have to bound the design into a certain type of an envelope that it has to meet. This is usually done with what's known as the SDC or Synopsis Design Constraints Syntax. It's a superset of Tickle. Okay, there are three main categories of timing constraints. Clock definitions, the things that we tell it about the clock itself. There's modeling the world external to the chip and there are timing exceptions. In addition, we'll discuss design role, rules uh, that we can also de define through SDC syntax. So just a few things before we get to that. Collections. Collections, like the stamp collection over here, is uh, something that's special about SDC. So you think you know Tickle if you've uh, done any course on Tickle or you've done some programming in Tickle, but EDA tools uh, decided to use Tickle, the tool command language, as their basis for writing different scripts and so forth, but uh, it wasn't sufficient for them and they decided to define a different data structure called a collection. Okay, so a collection is like a tickle list. If you remember, a tickle list is just a, a, um, actually a bunch of um, strings that are connected together with a space or something like that. Um, in fact, everything in tickle is just a string, and that wasn't sufficient when wanting to define different things like SDC. They wanted to say, listen, if you have a pin or a net or a cell, these things have additional parameters to them, so let's define something else. Therefore, a, um, if everything in Tickle is just a string, a collection is a pointer to an, an array or a struct or something like that that has different information about uh, the string. Um, the, the, the thing is that if we do anything like a for each or uh, different uh, operations, tickle operations on a collection, well, we're actually just seeing this um, string, which is the pointer to where the collection is in the memory. So you can't go and run a for each on a collection because you'll run over these different pointer values and not actually what's inside the collection. Therefore, there's a bunch of um, uh, collection specific functions that allow us to do things with collections. For example, instead of running for each on a collection, we would ri run for each in collection. Here's a short list of the different things that uh, you can do with collections. For example, index collection is similar to what would be in tickle L index to um, show what the nth um, index in a tickle list is. You would show uh, index collection N would show what the um, nth um, member of a collection is. Or size of collection is like L length. 
um, and so far, uh, so forth and so on. Um, one of the important ones is get object name, which allows us to return the name that we often call the collection um, that means something and not just the pointer to that collection. Another point is what uh, are known as design objects, and here there's a difference between how uh, Synopsys and Cadence do it, so I will just uh, go over it shortly. Here we have some sort of a Verilog module called foo with, input, with uh, ports A, B, and out. A and B are inputs, output is an output. We also have an internal wire called N1. Um, inside this we have instantiations to two standard cells, inv x1 and NAND x3. Um, we called the inverter U1, we called the NAND U2, and and we have our referencing by name, um, so the input of the inverter gets uh, uh, the input A, the output of the inverter gets this wire, this NAND, the input of it gets uh, N1, the other input gets B, and the output gets out, and that's the whole module. Well, when we wanted to discuss these things in our um, different tools, um, using SDC and using the rest of the things that we'll be using throughout the, um, uh, the course, we have to define what the different parts are called. So we call this thing that, that, that that's written after the module, this name, we call it a design. So foo is our design. It's often called the current design, and we, uh, we can use a, the command current design to find out which design is our, our scope is looking at right now. Then we have something called a cell. A cell is an instantiation of, uh, of some sort of a, of a design if we were at a different scope. So for example, U1, is an instantiation of inverter one and this we call it a cell if we would do something like get cells we would re receive something like u1 um, in parenthesis here we have the cadence name which is now called an inst the other side of this the actual um, module that we're looking at uh, inv x1 that's called a reference so a module if we were to instantiate foo somewhere uh, inside that other scope it would be known as a reference in um, in cadence this is called a module okay uh, when we are looking at the scope the primary inputs and outputs of this scope of this design they are called ports so the ports of module foo are a b and out However, if we look inside an instantiation such as U1, U1 is not in our scope. It's a, it's a subclass. It's a sub uh, instance of our scope. So the ports of U1 of this inverter are called pins in this case. In uh, um, uh, dot, uh, in is and out are the pins to um, this U1 instance. Okay. Um, N1 is a the wires of the design. It's called a net. And finally, we have a special net that's called a clock. Um, uh, you, we also call it a clock tree in Cadence, and we'll discuss a clock often. The last thing that's kind of background to this SDC is what we call helper functions. So we saw what the different parts of the design are, and now we're going to see, and we saw what a collection is. Now we're going to see how we can get collections of different parts of the design. Um, pay attention that these will only work after design elaboration. Before that, we don't have any uh, knowledge of what the different uh, design cells, ports, etc. are. So here's what we had on the previous slide, right? And we have these commands that are called get commands. So we have get ports, get pins, get nets. So for example, if we were to write get ports star, Sometimes you can remove the star and it will understand it's a star. Star is a glob. It um, grabs everything. So if we do get port star when our scope, uh, when our current design is foo, what we would get returned is a collection that includes a, b, and out. If we were to do get pins on um, u1 slash star, what we would get are um, u1 in and u1 out. Okay, and if, uh, but that's a collection of those guys, and if we want to iterate over them, we'd have to do um, for each in collection. And if we want to know the names, we'd have to get get object name of get pins u1 star. So let me write that down a second. We can do get object name, and then um, square brackets get pins u1 star. And it will print out u1 slash in and, and u1 slash out, a list of those two. Okay, and get nets 
will return us uh, n1. Okay, um, we can also add this minus hierarchical to help us uh, go down in designs if we don't know things like this name u1. Sometimes that, that can be a bit painful. So uh, there are some ways of doing it easier, which are with these all commands. So for example, if we look at the module foo and we only want to have the inputs, we can use all inputs and we'll get a, a collection of A and B. If we do all outputs, we'll get a collection that includes out. That's instead of doing uh, get ports star minus filter uh, collection uh, minus filter collection direction equals in and I'm not going to go into that syntax over here but it can get pretty complex so it's much easier just to write all inputs or all outputs or all registers will actually go through the whole design and re uh, return all the uh, flip-flops and latches that it finds okay so we finished with all the kind of sidestepping of background work that's going to be used now and we're going to deep dive into SDC or the synopsis design constraint so how do we define a clock a clock has to uh, have a bunch of stuff about it. First of all, where does it come from? In other words, is it external? Does it come from an input port, either to the whole chip or to our specific design? Or for example, if we look at a chip, often a PLL, a phase lock loop, is what uh, makes the clock. So the output of the phase lock loop would be the source of the clock. So we have to tell the tool where the clock actually starts so we can see where it, uh, it dissipates to and what um, its sinks are. What are the, the, the different modules that receive that clock? What is the clock period? So obviously we have to tell it what that big T is, what the operating frequency is. And what is the duty cycle? We can also tell it. Usually we don't tell it because we don't usually care much about the falling edge of the clock if we're in a positive edge uh, triggered design and therefore we assume the default of a 50% duty cycle. So how we do that is with the create clock command. And this is the maybe most important command in SDC, create clock, we want to tell it what the period is, so we do dash period, and this will be in by default in nanoseconds, even though you can override that. We give it a name. This is some sort of a friendly name that we're going to use to discuss it. And if we do get clocks, uh, for example, afterwards, it will return us a collection that includes a clock named my clock. And we have to, uh, without any dash, we have to give it the source of the clock. You cannot define a clock without the source. And um, the source of the clock is uh, a port called CLK, and we'll get the collection of that by get ports clock. Many of the tools will also accept it if we just wrote CLK, but it's uh, more uh, verbose to write get ports clock inside square brackets like that. Okay, so that made this clock that has a 20 nanosecond period that came out of a port here that was called um, CLK. Okay, and we call this clock my clock. So that's our first SDC command. That's what it looks like. Um, question, can there be more than one clock in a design? Yes, of course there can, but you gotta be really careful about clock domain crossing. We'll discuss it briefly. We can do a whole course just about clock domain crossing. There are tools for checking this and ensuring that you don't make things uh, wrong happen. But one of the things that uh, we do often find are generated clocks. So for example, if you take a clock and stick it into a clock divider, uh, you have a clock that we, we, we know how it's made, it's all internal to our design, is generated from the same clock. And to define a generated clock, we use the create generated clock command. It's kind of a similar type of a syntax to the create clock command. We give it some sort of a name, gen clock, we tell it what the source is. Okay, that's where the original, um, the original clock comes from. We tell it what the division factor is. So this is a divided by two clock. And we uh, show what the pin where it disseminates from similar to the source here of this guy. So that's a generated clock. And we can often have designs which have many, many generated clocks. So during synthesis, our clock is ideal. Remember, we don't have any um, skew. So we want to tell it that, listen, you don't have to go and stick uh, the high fan out of the clock into your wired load model and get this large delay in this terrible transition. So what we'll do is we'll say set ideal network on the clock. Um, for realistic timing, we should put some sort of transition because if you remember, um, in our lib files, we have this table that says uh, clock transition and, uh, and I mean, net transit uh, uh, input transition and output load and there are all these um, 
uh, options here according to our lookup table and for each of them we get uh, some sort of a value somewhere around here and we do some uh, uh, interpolation to find out what the actual TPD is, T rise and T fall of the output, even the power and so forth. If we give it a zero, which is what said ideal network is doing, we're somewhere that's out of table. Since this is a nonlinear delay model, all of the types of them are. Um, bringing something that's out of table is really bad. It's very unrealistic. So we want to give it some sort of a value that is at least inside the table so the rest of the design works in a, in a normal type of functional way. So what we would do is we would say set clock transition, um, give it some sort of transition so the clock instead of looking like this will look like this. And that way when we take our flip-flop and we look at the transition that goes into the rising edge of the flip-flop, we have uh, something here, in this case 0.2, and we can go and find where 0.2 is on our T-rise in our table and not have something that's out of table over here. Okay, we might also want to add some jitter, so jitter we'll talk about later, but if we want some sort of jitter, we define that as clock uncertainty. That's part of our delta margin that we showed before. Okay, so we say set clock uncertainty 0.2, we can have add it to hold and uh, set up separately by adding something like minus setup. Um, so that's a, an option to do is add uncertainty to our clock. And finally, I just want to note that after building a clock tree, we, we don't want the clock to be ideal anymore. Um, we want it to have real delays and real um, transitions and so we would use this set propagated clock um, on the tools nowadays often they are able to tell um, that there was a clock tree built after clock tree synthesis and therefore we won't actually need to add this command into the SDC or provide a separate SDC after clock tree synthesis but uh, if there is such a command don't usually use it during synthesis because it can cause strange things to happen okay so that was uh, uh, discussing our clock there other things. There are books about SDC. Um, we could talk about it for hours, but that's the basic clock definitions. Now let's go into IOs. So as we discussed before, there are different types of paths. There's a reg to reg path, into reg path, reg to out path, and into out paths. For a reg to reg path, defining the clock basically gives us all we need to know. But um, for an into reg path, a reg to out path, and into out path, we have what is happening outside the chip, this guy, and this guy that we have no idea about. We don't know where the actual flip-flop is or what type it is, what its setup time, etc. is. We don't know what the delay to the flip-flop is, and we don't know anything about the clock skew that gets to the, the, the position here. We know that there has to be something that uses this data that we uh, pushed out of, the, of our, our block somewhere, and we can assume it's some sort of a synchronous flip-flop or something, but we have no, no idea about it. And if we have no idea about it, we can never meet any type of, or define any type of max and min delay on such a path or uh, similarly on such a path. So what we have to do is we have to make some sort of a model for this. Okay, so um, the first way, uh, the traditional way, I guess, to do it is setting an input and output delay. So if we would know that mm, the delay over here, the arrival time at uh, this node is say um, 0.8 nanoseconds, right? Then we could give what we call an input delay and say it took 0.8 nanoseconds from the rising edge of the clock that is the same clock that reaches this point. Similar here, if we say that it took from the output of here, it took to get to D over here, um, let's say it took two and a half nanoseconds for the, the uh, example I'm gonna show, then it would say we would say there's two and a half nanoseconds delay on this path with the same clock clocking the output. So how we would show that is set input delay 0.8, that's saying this guy here is 0.8 nanoseconds, minus clock, it's from the same clock that reaches here, the same clock that we gave it a, a, a name CLK. Um, and we're gonna define this thing perhaps on all of the inputs to design. So we would do it on all inputs, but we don't wanna define it on the clock input because that would be very strange. So we do remove from collection we remove from all inputs the input that's called clock. So it puts it on all of the inputs except for the input clock. Similarly, for the output delay, we would say set output delay two and a half nanoseconds from uh, that's relative to this clock, and we're going to put it on all of the outputs of the design. There is a better methodology that's called a virtual clock. Um, let's not confuse you too much at this point. I'll get back to that. This is very confusing and problematic, anything to do with these uh, I.O. constraints. 
In fact, what I'm going to show you now is a different approach to IO constraints, and that's with using um, a command called set max delay. So a max delay is not looking at all at a synchronous type of a clock um, sort of a, 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 of a definition. It's just looking at the delay between two points in a design. Um, sometimes, and we will discuss a bit later why we want to look at max delays rather than looking at input and output delays. So what I can do is, for example, do set max delay, some sort of number, five nanoseconds, minus from all of the inputs except for clock. What will that do? So we have our design here. We have our, um, uh, our clock input here that our clock input goes to some sort of a flip-flop, right? And we have a, some sort of an input here, let's say A, and it goes through some sort of a delay over to here. What set max delay is, it says, listen, this will take five nanoseconds. Has nothing to do with any of the skew on the clock where it rises or falls. Why that can be better is because we have no clue what the skew or anything was on this clock, and we were uh, assuming it has to do with this clock. This just says, listen, let's just constrain that to five nanoseconds. And we'll see why that's very important later on in the course. Okay, Same, similar, we can say set max delay five to all outputs. So we have our thing here, and here's our some sort of an output, right? So it says set max delay, that means from clock. Remember, this is the whole uh, launch path. That should take no more than five nanoseconds. Um, it would be better to make it from the queue of the flip-flop to out, but that's a possibility. Okay, additional, we must model the transitions on the inputs. So um, one of the things here is, what is the transition of this node A here, right? Is it something that goes up um, ideally that brings us to the same problem with the out of table. So it would be much better, for example, to say that assume, to make it uh, uh, relative to our technology, that there's some sort of inverter here that's actually driving this, which will give it a more realistic type of a waveform. And so what we can do is set driving cell, say what the cell that drives all these inputs is, it says it gets from this, the, the library, get lib cells is one of these get commands that looks for things in li libraries. My lib, that's the name of my library here, inv4, that's some sort of a inverter inside my library. And it says, take the, the Z pin, the output pin of that. It says, okay, listen, this guy is the guy who's driving my uh, inputs. And that gives a more realistic type of a look. Again, we would do it on all of the inputs except for clock. In fact, it's very important to model what the thing is here. We can also go and say what the input transition is on this instead of putting a driving cell, but it would be better to put a driving cell over there instead of in a, an ideal um, type of a ramp. Nor, uh, similarly, when we have some sort of a, uh, so at our output of our design, we had this, oops, we had this flip-flop. It drove some sort of a cloud. There was some sort of a, a gate here that reached this output called out. But what is out here? We don't know. So um, if there's nothing, if the capacitance is zero, then this uh, this guy would be working too fast and so forth. We could put a minimum size inverter or something here. So we better model some sort of load here. What is this load? Well, we'll just use some sort of load. Um, well, say, for example, we can take an inverter from our library, look at what the input is of, of it, and uh, set that on all the outputs, and that will model this type of a load. So it's very important to model our outputs. Okay, to summarize our constraints, let's look at it again. So this is our design. These reg to reg paths, they're completely um, enveloped inside our design, but these into out, uh, into reg paths and reg to out paths and the into out paths as well, they uh, need to ha have the part that's missing modeled in, uh, in order for us to apply our static timing analysis to them. So what we do is we do something like an input constraint, an input delay to model this guy, an output delay to model this guy. In addition to that, we have to show what our um, driver is here. So that's like our... Um, uh, uh, set driving cell and we have to show what our output load is and so that's with the set load. So that's how we're going to uh, model our inputs and outputs to our design. Next, uh, the, the next category that we're going to discuss is timing exceptions and there are several types of uh, timing exceptions that we have to define for the STA. One of those, is, for example, is the topology of the network we saw earlier and if you remember we had uh, this type of a path that was non-existent right because uh, we could if we had zero here we have one here so we cannot go through that type of a path and the same for uh, this side so if we want to define such a thing what we have to do is we have to define these two paths as a false path how do we do that well we use from through into 
Okay, so from our start points to our endpoints and through our any internal pins uh, that we have in the design. So how would we do that? We would say set false path. That's our uh, SDC command minus through because we're not we don't have to say from uh, to, to define this path, all we have to say is that it goes both through this and this. So we say get pins mux1, pin i0, and uh, minus through get pins mux2, pin i0. Similarly, we should set a false path that goes through mux1, pin i1, and mux2, pin i1. So that would set a false path there, and we wouldn't have a problem that this could be potentially become our worst negative slack. Uh, in fact, we won't even check that timing path. Uh, an uh, another type of uh, false path that is very commonly seen is a clock synchronizer. So um, a synchronizer is just a shift register. It's this type of thing with usually two flip-flops. It can be made sometimes with more of them. And it's clocked by this C2, which is a, a second clock. Um, this is driven by paths that are clocked by flip-flops that get um, a different clock. So we have a, cro a clock domain crossing, which is something that is uh, illegal to do. I will give a short overview of synchronizers later on in the course, but um, in general, we are not allowed ever to um, take a one clock and talk to another clock, to have a launch path on one clock and a capture clock on the, the other clock. This will always be a timing violation. A synchronizer is used where we um, know that this is a possible thing to do by design. And obviously, um, this path is very problematic because it can never meet timing. So what we have to do is define it as false path. So how we would do that is set false path minus from flip-flop 1 CP, and this would be called CP, to flip-flop 2 D. That means this is a false path. It won't check timing on it, and we won't get any violations. In an alternative way, we can just say, listen, we know by design, and we checked it very well, and we used a, a clock domain crossing um, tool to check that we don't have any of these types of violations that we didn't know about. Um, we can say, listen, set type of a, a global false path between all of the things that are on clock one and clock two. Better than setting such a global false path, what we should do is say set clock groups minus logically exclusive minus group get clock C1 minus group get clock C2, and that will remove all of the paths that go through clock one and clock two. Um, uh, so that's another type of a, a um, SDC command that we could use. There is a third type of a thing here where we might be, for instance, going from a slow, uh, uh, from a uh, fast clock to a slow clock or a slow clock to a fast clock. And by design, it's supposed to work. And such a path is supposed to, for example, take two clock cycles. So we have this flip-flop that's driving another flip-flop. And we know that the delay here will take two clock cycles. Um, so this is our uh, launch uh, peer, uh, edge, and this is our capture edge, and we want to tell the tool how to do that. What we're going to do is use a command called set multi-cycle path. So set multi-cycle path um, from flip-flop 1 CP to flip-flop 2 D, right? That's what we wanted to do. Um, and we say that it will take two clock cycles. But look here, we said that's minus setup. So that's a multi-cycle path only for setup or max delay checks. Um, the way that multi-cycle path is defined, and you can Google it and read about it, um, is that if we would do that, we'd probably get hold violations in other place, places. So we have to define uh, set multi-cycle path minus hold, where we put our multiplier of the cycles as what, uh, one less than the multiplier of this. So if this was 10, this would be 9, for example. If you don't do that, you're going to get all kinds of strange hold situations. Again, you're invited to go and Google it and understand why, but uh, I think that for a basic thing, just remember that rule. Every time you write a set multi-cycle path minus setup, add a minus hold, that is one uh, multiplier less. Okay, uh, finally we can discuss case analysis, which is a special um, command that defines constants in our design. Okay, so there are many designs, uh, many uh, values in a design that can assume to be constants. For example, if we're going to write a register, um, uh, write a certain value at startup, and then uh, in this operating mode it will be constant, or we're going to hold an external pin or something like that at a constant value. What we want to do is we want to make sure that um, this constant is propagated through the, the tool. For example, if we have an AND gate when one of the inputs um, is a zero, we know that the output is a zero, um, 
regardless of what is here, right? So we don't want to have this as any timing path because it's constantly a, a zero. It doesn't matter how this rises and falls. This is not going to change, so it's actually a false path. That, to do that, it's called constant propagation. So if we define this pin as a zero, it's going to propagate the constant and basically set false paths on all of these other paths that go through design. Okay, that is done with a case analysis. So um, to propagate the case analysis, is we use a set case analysis command. So set case analysis zero, and we say, for example, get ports test mode. So this is telling us that um, we are not in test mode in our SDC. We're going to set a case analysis zero on the port called test mode. Okay. Design rule violations. This is the last category, basically, of SDC commands that we're going to be discussing. I think that covers all of them. There may be all kinds of corner cases that are strange SDC commands that you probably will never use, but you can look up uh, these things up in a book. For now, this is the last category we're going to discuss. So uh, design rules, we can either define this inside our uh, synthesis and place and route tool, or we can define it through SDC commands. And um, so we have uh, three types of uh, major design rule violations. One is the transition of a net. So we can write set max transition and give it some number in nanoseconds. And that will check, uh, or uh, the tool will check, that no net has a larger transition, a T-rise or a T-fall uh, above this uh, constraint. You can do set min transition as well. Um, maximum capacitance. So you would do set max capacitance and say what the maximum capacitance is. Now, these two uh, definitions are ultra important. And the reason, again, being our lib file that has our T-rise and our C-load and it has a set of values. And remember, to be inside the table, which is extremely important because we don't know what's going on over here or over here or over here or over here. We have to have all of our values of uh, transitions and capacitances inside the table. So you want to set a min and max capacitance in the ranges that are defined in these tables. Um, and you can do that through SDC. Usually the tools will actually read these from the lib files. But if you want to override what the default from the lib file is, you can do it through these SDC commands. You can also define a max fan out of a gate. Um, that just says, OK, we have some inverter. Don't let this inverter uh, have more than a fan out of 20. So you'd say set max fan out 20 or something like that. It's um, not something that usually is a, a, a straightforward constraint, more like a max capacitance would be the constraint. But um, it's something that kind of as a uh, rule of thumb, we, should, we may want to keep a, such a max fan out. A final point about um, ST, about uh, at least constraints and uh, uh, and so forth. So we have something called yield-driven uh, approaches and advanced static timing analysis. There, there are many, 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 many concepts, approaches, terminologies, and all kinds of things that are used in timing analysis to achieve high yield sign-off. For example, on-chip variation or OCV, advanced on-chip variation (AOCV). Even have parametric on chip variation, POCV, signal integrity, and there are many more. In fact, I put a little asterisk here that said that between the time I wrote this slide and presented it to you, each EDA vendor has presented another method for timing closure that you just much know about and you have to use or else your chip is not going to work. Okay, that is obviously cynical, but it's true. We get uh, at every snug and at every CDN live new um, new types of OCV and new types of timing constraints that are presented. Okay, so um, we'll we'll discuss this in the future. But these are these parts of the delta margin that we discussed before. Um, they will fill up our delta margin. Um, the harder usually we make it to close timing, then somebody will come up with another thing that will remove a bit of our constraint. Okay, uh, that was just kind of a cynical um, uh, remark about that, but there are many, many, many more things that uh, uh, today are used and uh, some of them are really important. So now that we finished discussing the design constraints, let's go into the actual timing reports that come out of it and are used both for optimization and for us to check uh, our design. Okay, so we'll start discussing check types. First of all, throughout the lecture, we've discussed the two primary timing checks, setups or max delay and hold or min delay. However, in practice, there are um, a few other categories that you will encounter. Recovery, removal, clock gating, minimum pulse width, and data to data. And we'll very, very briefly discuss these on the next slide. So starting with recovery, removal, and minimum pulse width checks. 
The recovery and removal checks are both for asynchronous reset signals, set or reset signals. So recovery is defined as the minimum time that an asynchronous signal input pin must be stable after being deasserted and before the next clock transition. So in other words, you can see here, this is a reset signal, a low reset signal that's deasserted here. So we came out of reset and um, this is the amount of time for recovery that we have to be um, uh, clear before we rise, raise the clock. A removal check is the minimum time the NASA chrono signal input pin must be stable before being deasserted and after the previous clock transition. So here's the previous clock transition, and here's how long we should wait until we deassert this reset. So these are two checks that are often uh, that are checked by the timing engines. Um, we usually don't run into problems with them, um, so we don't discuss them as much as the max and min delays. Finally, we have the minimum pulse width, or the MPW check, which is also defined inside our lib files. There's an MPW table, and it's the amount of time after the rising falling edge of a clock that the clock signal must remain stable. So it's actually discussing how long the clock signal has to, to be um, if it gets ruined by transitions and so forth. So that should not happen. We'll have to buffer or fix that transition in some other way. The category of clock gating is uh, more common, you'll see it often, and a uh, clock gating check happens anywhere where we have anything that gates the clock. Gating the clock is something that blocks the clock, and if we have, for example, an AND uh, gate on the clock, um, if there's an enable signal here that's going to be pulled down, and if this is the clock going through, we're, we're going to have a gate. It's not going to show up. The output's going to be zero. So this is considered a clock gate, uh, as we kind of discussed um, in the previous lecture, but uh, any uh, ba basically any logic on the clock that's not an inverter or a buffer is going to gate the clock at some sort of uh, uh, condition. So we have to do a clock gating check that ensures that the arrival of a signal here um, will be in time, that it won't cause some sort of a glitch on the clock. So that's what a uh, clock gating check is. And we have uh, here two, uh, two examples, one where um, we have the rising edge of the clock over here, and we have to have some sort of a check that the, the clock gate signal arrives before this, and it, it, uh, it is stable at least a certain amount of time before it goes down, and a similar example on the falling edge of the clock to the rising edge of the clock. So these are clock gating checks, and they will appear, and you will see that there are races between this kind of enable signal and the clock signal, and they have to often be fixed. Okay, so those are all the categories of basic timing checks that are run in our design, and now we'll start going to the actual report. So we want to check our design. One of the first things to do is run this report analysis coverage um, command, which shows us basically all of the types of checks that were done, set up and um, uh, clock gating and uh, pulse width recovery and so forth, the things that I talked about. It shows you how many of these types of paths were checked, how many of them were met and versus how many were violated and what number were untested and we should uh, try to understand these types of things see if it fits what we expected and see why things were untested or violated we can use the check timing command to perform a variety of consistency and completeness checks on the timing constraints for a specific design we should really check if there are unconstrained paths if we understand what they all are and why uh, that can often um, point us to something that is that some sort of flip-flop that doesn't get a clock and then it's not checked at all. The most important command probably that we have in all of our tools is the report timing command. I'm going to use the stylus common UI syntax that is now used by both Genus, uh, Innovus, and Tempus, but um, it's similar types of reports will be shown for tools such as uh, Design Compiler, ICC, and so forth. Okay, so uh, what we have is we have like an arrival time of the data and the required time and we have the setup and hold and, and different types of things that we discussed and we're going to be looking at these types of timing reports but in a whole like list of type of a thing. Okay, so when we uh, type report timing, we're going to get this long, long thing. You see the, these three dots mean that this was a very, very, very long type of a list here. And um, uh, it has two parts. One part is the header, and the second part is the launch path. That's the default of what at least Innovus is going to be usually showing when we write report timing. So I'm going to zoom in on the header, which shows us basically all of the data we need to know about our design. Okay, so this is really uh, um, 
uh, verbose type of a, a slide, a set of slides that's going to show you different parts and how you can extract different information from your timing report. So what we have here is we'll have the path number. That means uh, that's usually ordered in terms of worst negative slack. So remember in our STA algorithm, we actually got the worst path first, and then we could find what the second worst path and the third worst path by removing them and heapifying. So that's what we'll get here. This is the worst path that we asked for, or the worst path. And it says violated. That means if we have negative or positive slack, violated is negative slack, met is positive slack. And then it actually shows us the slack, which is 0.03 nanoseconds. So we have here um, three picoseconds of negative slack. And we, uh, uh, we can see here that it says it's a setup check with pin, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we know that this is a setup check and not a hold check. There are other things here that we'll uh, go into. So the path group, this is a reg to reg path. Remember, we defined our different types of path groups. We have the start point. The start point here is this long um, type of a thing um, with uh, at the clock pin of this flip-flop. Remember, start points are usually the clock pins of flip-flops. The end point is this long name here, the D pin of the next flip-flop. And you can tell that these are both flip-flops because the synthesizer added the underscore reg notation after them. Um, in addition, these R's or F mean that these are rising or falling edges. Now pay attention that the clock and this shows which clock it's between, will always be a rising edge because, as I said, we're assuming and we're most of the time using only positive edge-triggered flip-flops. But the data path itself can be either rising or falling. Then we have this uh, area here which discusses our, um, uh, our, uh, our clock edges, source latency, uh, and so forth. It, it, it's telling about our um, clock paths to both the capture and the launch. Uh, paths. So the capture path, which for some reason comes on the left side here, shows what uh, when the clock edge arrives. So that's basically zero plus big T. So we defined an SDC constraint of uh, six nanoseconds here. And so the capture path arrives at a setup check one, uh, one period, a clock period after the launch path. So it's six, where, whereas the launch path comes out at the original edge, which is time zero. The source latency and the, and the net latency and so forth, these are discussing um, parts that we'll get into more uh, better in clock tree synthesis, but it's showing the actual length of the propagation of the clock. And uh, this is when the clock actually arrives at the flip-flop. So this one arrives at, uh, uh, at a delay of 20 picoseconds, and this one arrives at a delay of 19 picoseconds. Then we'll look at the different points of the design. So setup is the uh, flip-flop setup time, and that's going to be 90 picoseconds here. Um, it's going to have uncertainty that we defined with set clock uncertainty to define like the jitter of the design. Um, CPPR we will discuss briefly later on, and the required time is actually the arrival time minus the setup minus the jitter. So our required arrival time, kind of like our rat at the end point, is 5.806 nanoseconds. Um, the launch clock we saw over here had a uh, 19 picosecond delay, and the data path delay uh, was uh, 5.79 uh, pico uh, nanoseconds. That's the uh, arrival time. So this plus this uh, arrives at our general arrival time, and the final clock, si uh, clock calculation can be the required time minus the data path plus the, the launch clock path, and it gives us our final slack of. Uh, three picoseconds. Now that may have seemed confusing. That's the way that Cadence decided to show the uh, this um, type of a path, but it, it just is trying to tell you that if you understand all of what uh, this is saying, you can find out a lot of data about this certain path. Now we'll go and look uh, down below at the actual launch path. And uh, again, a standard timing report, when we just write report timing, will show just this launch path. So the launch path starts at the start point, which as we can see here is uh, the, the clock pin of the flip-flop and shows a lot of stuff on this type of a uh, slide. On, uh, uh, so we have the fan out of this, um, uh, of this clock uh, pin over here. It had a 13 uh, flip-flops it saw. It, it was a rising edge over here on uh, that it was uh, driven by this uh, pin. Okay, the instance name here that, um, that, that, that drove this pin or the pin name is over here, right? The timing arc, for instance, on this, um, on this type of a cell, it went from an A to a Y arc from pin A at the input to pin Y at the output. Um, what time 
each of these uh, what what the arrival time the at actually at each one of these output pins was and what the transition on the net was here it was 105 picoseconds um, we can also have the the delay over here was what the gate plus wire delay was between uh, this time and this time. So there's a lot of data that's written here in the in the timing report and we'll see how we can customize that as well. Um, what we didn't see here is we didn't see all this data about the capture and launch uh, clock path. So I often uh, prefer to use report timing minus path type full clock and that shows me both the propagation of the clock to the uh, launch flip-flop and to the capture flip-flop. So when we do that you just have to pay attention that some of the timing uh, has changed a bit because of the way that Cadence uh, likes to show this. So right now what we can see here is we have now the launch clock um, at the bottom uh, uh, it was added uh, uh, to the this uh, launch path um, uh, report and we also have this uh, source latency and the actual starting point now is this negative number which we will we can explain later okay but what we see here is that the start point of the of the path now is at the actual clock port and not at the clock pin of the flip-flop we only reach the clock pin of the flip-flop way down here okay so this is the start point of the path that we had before or it's the Q pin of the start point because we're not showing nets in this in this uh, example. Okay, and when we continue down, we um, get to see that this is the same uh, um, endpoint that we saw before. This is the endpoint of the the launch path, and then we get to the other endpoint. This is the capture path. So now at the capture path, we can see that we have um, the same clock port. It also starts at this clock underscore i input, and it ends at the the endpoint uh, the endpoint uh, uh, flip flop, but it's clock port. So uh, if we would have looked at the header again, this is where it ended, and we can see uh, the whole propagation through the capture path. So it's often uh, better, or I think it's better to look at this whole um, timing report that includes everything that the clock propagates through once we have finished clock tree synthesis. Now, as I said, we can customize the uh, defaults that are shown here because we may not like them. And in fact, I don't um, particularly like exactly how it's shown and I have a different example here. So we can d uh, ask for different things to be added and in Innovus uh, with common UI, we use this minus fields option to get what we need. So we can write report timing minus fields and add this long thing that will show us the actual names of the columns out of a, a long list of options that we have. So what we can see here when we use uh, the choice that I showed here, we have the timing point. Okay, that's the actual point that we're discussing with timing. If we add the minus nets option, we'll also see the names of the nets that the, um, the design propagates through. But right now it's just showing uh, mainly the driving pins of each net. Okay, the standard cell names, and I blacked that out so we don't um, uh, release anything about the standard cell library that I'm using. Okay, the uh, timing arc from which pin input pin to which output pin uh, this, uh, this propagated through, if it was a rising or falling edge. Okay, um, what the wire load was, um, what the load of this uh, net was. Okay, what the transition time was, what the delay, uh, the total delay through the cell was, and what the final arrival time was. I didn't mention here, also the fan out of this, uh, of this driving pin. So that's kind of what I like to look at. Um, now, the thing is that by default, as I mentioned before, report timing shows us the, the most critical path, only one of them. It shows us the pin with the, uh, it shows us the path with the worst negative slack, but sometimes we'll want to look at other things. We want to analyze a specific path or a set of path. Uh, maybe I want to see only the paths that come from the primary inputs. So I can use these flags that we saw um, uh, briefly before when we were discussing set false path the minus from, minus to, minus through flags and different variants of them. Okay, so minus from is to select a start point, minus two is to select an endpoint, and minus three is to select any other pin that's inside uh, our um, data. So uh, we can also discuss if we want the rising um, propagation or falling propagation, for example, minus through rise or minus clock from. Okay, so um, report timing minus from flip-flop one clock, 
and that's a start point, so we're allowed to use it in a minus from field. Minus through fall, we only want to see falling um, uh, edges through mux1 i0. Minus 2, all outputs will show us only those paths that actually adhere to that constraint. Another thing is that we have is path groups. So remember we had this in reg to reg, into reg, reg to out, and so forth. Um, we can also have paths that end at clock gates, which could be called reg to path gate, and treat them separately. If we use this command, this create basic path groups, it will actually go and create path groups for all of these different types, and then report them separately and optimize them se separately. Okay. Um, However, maybe we want to differentiate between a specific uh, group of paths for one reason or another. So we can use a, a command to do that, like the group path commands, group path minus from flip flop one clock to flip flop two D. Uh, that's my path. I want to have it displayed separately in my timing reports and, uh, and actually optimize separately. So I can do that. Um, if we want to report the timing for that, we just do report timing minus path group my path. So that was all setup timing. What about report timing for hold? So when we just wrote report timing, it was showing us the, the max delay. But after hold, we want to see that it meet after clock tree synthesis, we want to see the min delay. So what we'll do is we'll add the minus early flag. Report timing minus early will change our analysis view, which we'll, we'll discuss uh, in a little bit. And it will start looking at the hold paths. So um, did this work? This is the timing report we got. And uh, look, it says hold here. So this did work, and we actually met hold timing. That's pretty cool. Okay, we, I also mentioned that the analysis view changed to best case analysis view, which is what we expected for hold, as we'll discuss in a few minutes. Okay, um, now what did we say about uh, hold timing? We don't have this phase delay of a, of a period, so the capture path starts at the same edge as the launch path, which is what we would expect for a hold timing path. Instead of a setup constraint, we have a hold constraint over here and instead of um, required minus arrival we get the slack as a uh, arrival minus required so this is a different uh, type of a timing report and it's showing hold but it's very similar and all of the uh, components of it are similar to what we had for setup there's a very good uh, UI option in Novus that's called the debug timing tool. It now is uh, available in Genus as well with the Stylus Common UI. And what you can do is explore the timing report interactively, showing path schematics, SDC, highlighting the path in the layout. It's very convenient, um, even though us backend guys don't like to use GUIs. Well, how do you get to it? You hit timing, debug timing, and it will open uh, this timing path analyzer. You can look at the paths and uh, look at that whole timing report in a very interactive and kind of graphical way. Plus, as I said, you can do things like highlight the whole path in the layout on, uh, and so forth, uh, and even show a schematic of the path. So it can be very, very useful. So now that we've finished discussing timing reports, we can go over to the last part of our discussion today, which is called multi-mode, multi-corner, or how to deal with the corner crisis. Poor kid sitting in the corner. So there's more than one operating mode. During synthesis, we usually target timing for a worst case scenario. But what is worst case? So intuitively, we say that the worst case is when our chip comes out slow. So we have this slow, slow corner. Our PMOSs and NMOSs were both um, fabricated uh, with high VTs, and so they're slower. We have uh, some sort of IR drop, which makes our supply voltage lose 10% or so, and we traditionally have a high temperature, even though that may not be true nowadays with all kinds of temperature inversion. We didn't need to check hold. As we said, the clock was ideal, and if there's no skew, really, you don't have a hold problem. But what if there is an additional operating mode? For example, what if we have a test mode or a scan mode? When we have such a mode, do we have to close timing at the same high clock speed? For example, here we have this uh, table in our spec here that says that we have two modes, functional and test. We have some sort of a pin, maybe it's a register or an external port. They get some sort of case analysis on a zero or a one for a test mode, but for each of them we have a different frequency. Do we have to close timing in test mode at our, at our high frequency, at our one gigahertz frequency, or can we just close it at the 10 megahertz frequency that the spec uh, requires? So 
The way to deal with that is pretty easy. We can just prepare an additional SDC that, that instead of that will have a different case analysis on our test mode, and we can uh, we can run it separately. So we'd have one SDC that would have set case analysis one on test mode port, and we'd have create clock with a, a, a much slower clock that's called a. Um, and we call it test clock. So we would run our uh, STA and optimization separately. Hmm. So that sounds like a pretty good approach, does it? Well, maybe not because there are many, many, many corners. Real SOCs are much more complex. They have many operating modes. They have many voltage domains. With a real clock, we also need to check hold. So just for example, this type of a spec, we have these three different functional modes and a test mode. Each one of them has two different supply voltages, VDD1 and VDD2, and in each mode we have different vo uh, voltages uh, in the spec for each supply, which means we have different lib files that describe them and so forth. And then we have different frequencies running in each uh, type of mode for each area of the supply, um, which get different the different supply voltages. In fact, in mode number three, we have this VDD1, which is power gated and it's turned off, so there's not even any frequency. And we have to go and we have to check all of this, both in setup and in hold. We easily can reach hundreds of corners. Okay, we have setup and hold for every mode. We have signal integrity, um, so we may have noise that may cause hold problems that we didn't expect. So we better run hold on our setup corners as well. We have temperature inversion, which makes it uh, questionable. Which is the worst case? Is it the high high temperature, the low temperature? What if we want to check leakage? What if we want to check dynamic power for RC extraction? Is it worse if our metals are wider and higher, or is it worse when they're smaller and uh, lower? One of them makes the resistance higher, one of them makes the capacitance higher. So which one is worse? If we have to check all of that, we get some sort of a multi-dimensional cube of corners. We can easily get to hundreds or maybe more than that of corners. And what can we do? Are we going to make an SDC for each one? Are we going to run an optimization on each one? And all I can say is, ah! So we have this corner crisis. The traditional way of uh, applying this thing in many uh, companies, as far as I know, do this still today. We have different libraries with SDCs and maybe some timing information from the FCF. We run timing on it with some sort of tool like Tempest or Primetime. We see if it's okay. If it's okay, fine. If not, we go and we make some sort of a manual ECO. We extract it again. We run this again. We do this for all these millions of different corners. We probably can't do it with millions of different corners, so we only say we have one or two or maybe five or six corners. And we run this and we keep on doing this extraction and ECO and going back and forth and back and forth and trying to fix our design and this takes a lot of time and it often doesn't converge so that's not feasible with all these hundreds of corners multi-mode multi-corner to the rescue so as its name is what we're gonna do is we're gonna have this process an automated process that we can define many different modes and many different corners and we can go and have the tool know what each of them are load it run timing run optimization run timing again check it all in an automated way so we as users after we first defined it we don't have to do um, anything else the problem is um, this is kind of complex and therefore the implementation is a bit well a bit confusing as you'll see but in the end if we do it and we understand what we're doing it really simplifies things so the basic concept is that we create something called an analysis view an analysis view is something that we can check for setup or hold constraints. So an analysis view, since this is multi-mode, multi-corner, it contains a mode and a corner. And um, by putting those together, we derive this type of analysis view. So for example, in our spec, we might have three different types of views that we want to check. We have one called turbo mode. Turbo mode has high voltage. It has a high frequency. And we want to check it for setup because this is our, like, um, uh, this is our performance corner, so we put it at slow for worst case with 125 degrees, and we use this turbo operating mode. We have to set our different registers and stuff to the turbo mode. But then again, we have another mode that's a low power mode. In a low power mode, we have a low VDD, we have a low frequency. We still want to check it for setup, so we use a slow corner with a high temperature, um, but we give it an SDC that's made for low power. And Wait a second, turbo, we want to check it for hold as well. We'll probably want to check low power for hold as well. But just for this example, we want to check turbo for hold. And so we put a extra high VDD. We have the same high frequency, even though it may not matter for our uh, hold checks. Um, we take a fast corner, we take a minus 40 degree temperature and the same op mode as we have before to read the same SDC. So we have these three analysis views and then we say, hey, we're going to take 
do these setup checks we're going to do it on turbo and on low power mode and for hold we're only going to check it on uh, the turbo hold mode can we do all of that so let's see how we can do it and this is going to be some heavy syntax but don't worry at the end i have a slide that summarizes it all so we have to first of all design the analysis views and we're going to because we're looking at a top-down way instead of i think it's more clear than looking at it bottom up so an analysis view, as we said, has to define a mode and a corner. Modes are defined with something we call the constraint mode. Corners are so defined with something we call a delay corner. So, the, um, so assuming that we have already defined delay corners and constraint modes, which we'll show on the next slides, we can write create analysis view minus name turbo minus constraint mode turbo mode that's one of the constraint modes that we will make in a minute minus delay corner slow corner vdd 1.2 volts and we do that again for low power and for turbo hold assuming that we already have all these constraint modes and delay corners okay then we can say set analysis view which analysis views do we want to check minus setup we want to check setup on turbo mode and on low power mode and hold we only want to check on turbo hold mode just so you should know nowadays you can also set minus leakage for a corner that we want to test leakage and minus dynamic for a corner we want to check dynamic power on. A delay corner tells the tool how the delays are supposed to be calculated, therefore it contains timing libraries and extraction rules, and a constraint mode is basically the relevant SDC commands for the particular operating mode. We're going to see that on the next slides. Okay, so we're going to define these lower levels. First of all, as we said, the constraint mode is actually, it's this part, right, this mode part, and what the mode is, is what our SDC, actually the period and the um, set case analysis and so forth that we want to set on the, on the design. So it's just a bunch of SDC files that define that certain operating mode. Those same SDC files that we would reload and unload and so forth, now we're just going to define them in this thing called the constraint mode and connect it to our analysis view. So um, what do we do? We write create constraint mode minus name turbo mode and we give it a turbo.sdc file and we do the same thing create constraint mode we call it low power mode and we give it a different sdc file. So we finish the constraint mode and now we know where it came from on the previous slide. Same we have to do with our delay corner. Delay corners are a bit more complex because it has to have some timing condition in RC corner and a few other things. Um, but what, what we basically do is we say create delay corner, give it some sort of name, the names we used before, right? Slow corner VDD 1.2, VDD 0.5, and fast corner VDD 1.3. And we have to connect to it in RC corner, which we'll see in a minute, and a timing condition, which we'll also see in a minute. So delay corner is made up of the RC corner. That's how we run our extraction, how we get our resistances and capacitances, and a timing condition, which is how we run timing on our um, libraries. Are you confused? Well, we still have some more to go until we get to the summary, which will kind of put it all together for us. So the next stage is something called a timing condition. And a timing condition is something that can be used for a certain power domain. In this course, we'll just automatically connect the timing condition to a library set, not to get you confused. So this is just a one-to-one -one connection. We do create a timing condition, give it a name, and then uh, connect it to a library set, which we will see in a second. Um, so the library set, which is where we have uh, a bit more, is just a collection of the .lib files that should be used for the relevant gates. So um, in the library set, if we have, for example, standard cells, memories, and IOs, we have to say minus timing, standard cell libraries, and give it the relevant corner for the standard cells. If you remember, libs are created for a certain corner or a certain set of operating conditions which include extraction voltage and temperature uh, mem libs so that would be the same lib file for our srams and io libs that would be our lib file for our io cells and we can also give it some um, si signal integrity lib files for running uh, signal integrity characterization correctly the last part of our SD, of our uh, MMMC definition is an RC corner, and it's just a collection of the rules that are needed for RC extraction. Usually in Cadence tools, we use something called a QRC tech file, which is a binary file, which tells the tool how to run extraction. Now, um, we'll discuss it a bit later in the course, but there are different types of RC extraction when we have, as I mentioned before, wide and high metals or um, or thin and small metals and etc. Um, so let's just say we want to have maximum resistance 
a maximum capacitance, so we'll call this one RC max, and we have uh, this QRC tech file that's called RC max that we created um, uh, externally, uh, and it's not from here. We can also have these things called cap tables, and we have to provide a temperature to, to uh, uh, see the wire delays using temperature. Um, cap tables are kind of deprecated now, but in previous technologies, that's what was used. So to summarize all that confusing thing, and I hope this will make everything look clear, our top-down hierarchy looks like this. We have the views that we want to run set up and hold on. These are called our selected setup views and our selected hold views. Obviously, each one of them has to have a list of one or more views. So we choose from all of our analysis views which views we want to check setup and which views we want to check hold on. Now note that this is something that we don't have to do once. We can actually change our um, views that we want to check setup and hold on during the during the, the lifetime of the tool. For example, during synthesis, we actually don't need to check hold on anybody, but we'll want to check setup on our worst case. And um, maybe at the we don't want to check hold on all of our analysis views all the time because the optimization steps will take too long but towards the end of our um, of our uh, design during sign off we want to actually make sure that we don't have hold violations in all kinds of strange setup views which wouldn't usually happen but just for for a better case we'll add that to our selected hold views okay so now we have a list of these analysis views but what are they made out of so first of all we said that it's multi-mode multi-corner so for the mode part we have to have these constraint modes and each of these constraint modes is connected to a list of SDC files okay um, for the corners we have the delay corner and the delay corner is made up of timing conditions which are made up of library sets and of RC corners so again the RC corners are just the extractions like RC max okay usually it's this QRC tech file okay the uh, the timing conditions and library sets are just a list of the dot lib files that uh, are used for this corner um, for our standard cells our memories our IOs and our other IPs well do you think that was complicated I have a question for you what if I have multiple voltage domains so this is really complicated here it's in fact it's so complicated sometimes I have a hard time explaining it but let's say we have a chip and we have several power domains and let's say this one gets this 1.2 volts and this one gets this 0.5 volts but we instantiated an inverter inside and this is the same inverter so it's just a bunch it's just a, a regular old inverter with the same sizes and we ran characterization on it and um, we could run characterization once when this is 1.2 volts and once when this is 0.5 volts but the question is we uh, we only we have two different lib files one for this and one for that and this th this inverter, which is the same inverter, they're both called inv x1 or something like that, right? They're in two different voltage domains. Their timing characterizations, their TPD is different. How do we tell the tool that? Well, that's uh, really complicated. What happens even worse? What if we want to power down a module? Let's say we want to go and say, aha, in this mode, there is no voltage here, right? This is all cut off. Hmm, what do we do? And what happens if this is driving this when we don't have any voltage going into there? How can we do that? We'll have to retain the state so we actually drive these things and so forth. Hmm. And, and if we want to power it up and continue from the place we were before. This, this stuff gets really complex. Um, how do we even talk between this 1.2 volt domain and the 0.5 volt domain are opposite? Okay, and all I can say is ARG. So um, we'll briefly discuss this during the next lecture when we'll discuss some low power methodology. But for right now, that was all I wanted to discuss uh, uh, with timing. There was a lot there to handle. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, we'll go from now on to a more abstract stuff, which is the physical implementation of the design. And here are a few references that I, I used a lot here.